Welcome to Creep Time with Silas Dean. Today we are covering the eerie story of Mitrice Richardson. I really think this case is gonna drive you guys out of your mind. It is so confusing and it's frustrating. There are a whole slew of mistakes that were made here. I also covered it on TikTok a while ago. This was like one of my first videos I ever did and I usually don't do part twos on TikTok, but this was a case I think probably the first case where I did a part two. There were just so many minor details and so many questions surrounding it. We don't know if it's an accident, we don't know if it's a homicide or who was involved or if anybody knew something, if the police knew something. Stories like these also kind of ruin me because anything that dabbles with like corruption or like corrupt law enforcement, cover-ups, anything like that. Because the unspoken element of that is that any cover-up, but specifically cover-ups in law enforcement usually involve bigger names who were involved in something Thing or withholding information around something that they shouldn't have been. I don't really know what happened here. I don't know what took place in the in-between of this story because there are really two parts to it. It just has too many flags to be an open and closed conversation. Something happened here and we're gonna get into, you know, every element of this case and I will give you all of the facts of the story. But before we do, if you could help support me as the creator of Making Creep Time Happen, I would really appreciate it if you could give a like, a comment, and subscribe below, even turn on notifications. It's a completely free way that you can help to support your favorite creators in making the content that you love. And if you're not already and you want to follow me on socials, I'm gonna make sure to link them in the description. I just hit a million on TikTok as of today, like as I'm filming this video in real time, which is crazy. So if you want additional creepy content and you want to help support me on those channels, I would really appreciate a follow there as well. Let's get into this case. So I want to talk a little bit about who Mitrice Richardson was and why the context of that is especially important in the oddity of the night she went missing. Mitrice was born on April 30th in 1985, which would put her at 24 years old when all of this took place. She was a SoCal native. She grew up right in Covina, California, raised by her mother and her stepfather as her biological father was pretty much out of the picture from her early life. She was a very well-liked person, you know, she kind of grew up in these team atmospheres, whether it was through dance or competitive cheerleading, she always had a close-knit group of friends who were around her. And even as she got a bit older, she got involved with pageants. Everybody who knew her described her as a kind and very warm person and very, very intelligent and highly driven through her college career when she finished up her degree at Cal State. She was a psych major and she apparently did really well in her program and she found college as a whole to just be a very eye-opening experience and it's around this time that she comes out to her family as lesbian to which they were absolutely accepting of you know they told her that they loved her for whoever she was she had this really sound support system behind her so when and why does all of this go wrong so following college, Mitrice actually moves in with her great-grandmother to help take care of her, and this was actually a very enriching experience. You know, they had bonded quite a bit and they had a really tight relationship. They would have dinners together almost every Wednesday night, which is a beautiful thing that you can share with a grandparent or a great-grandparent, and this was something that was really important to her. Until one Wednesday night, for an unknown reason, Mitrice explains to her great-grandmother that she won't be able to have dinner with her that night, and then she leaves. This was fine, it's, it's not entirely jarring, it's just it was a little unlike her. But when she does leave, she for some reason gets on the road and she proceeds to drive 40 miles headed towards the beach. She's going to Malibu and she does arrive there by 7 o'clock. Once she's at the beach, she then goes directly to Joffrey's, which is a pretty well-known restaurant in that area. But she's going there completely alone. This is a fairly nice restaurant, and they do have valet parking, but this is where we get one of the first indications that something feels a little off here. So when Mitrice gets to valet, the attendant goes to park the car of the person who's in front of her, but when he comes back, he finds that Mitrice is sitting in his personal car. He opens the door and he questions her, to which she reportedly responds with a random mix of words. It doesn't really make sense. But he assists her out of the car and eventually escorts her into the restaurant, to which at this point she's speaking a little more normally and she's eventually just gonna be sad. I cannot stand stories like this where clearly it seems like something's off but nobody intervenes for some reason. I know it's frustrating, but this is what happened. So what happens in the restaurant? Mitrice does get sad and she orders her dinner, she gets a cocktail, it's fairly expensive, but almost immediately, odd behavior is clocked. 
she's talking to other tables and she's disrupting people, she's pulling up her chair to other tables. And again, it's not making sense because she's going up to people and she's saying things like she's from Mars and she's saying that her mother is Mother Nature and it's very clear that this is some kind of a psychotic break. Either that or she's under the influence of something. But eventually she does get up to leave and she's called out by management and they kind of you know latch onto her because she hasn't paid her bill. And although there are people in the restaurant and there are staff members who are willing to cover her tab, the management can tell that something's not quite right with her, so they opt to call the police. We do have a recording of management calling police, which kind of gives us a window while Maitrice was still in that restaurant, so we get a sense of what was happening. Lost Station, Deputy Shalef, I can help you. Hi, I'm calling from Joffrey's restaurant in Malibu. Yeah. Um, we have a guest here who is refusing to pay her bill, and we think she may, I mean, she sounds really crazy, she may be on drugs or something. Um, we are wondering if someone could come by and pick her up. Okay, well, what's the uh, address there? It's 27400 Pacific Coast Highway. And uh, is she a white, black, Asian, Hispanic? She's a um, young black girl. She's probably in her 20s. Okay, what's she wearing? She's wearing a black t-shirt and I think blue jeans. Is she with anybody else? No, it's just her. So she's picked up by officers and she's brought to a nearby station, but her car is left behind, which is eventually towed, and it has her car keys, it has her wallet, all of her money, her phone. Before she was taken away in a cruiser, she was actually given a sobriety test outside of the restaurant, and it was determined that she was sober, but her behavior was still odd, so I don't know why at that point she wasn't immediately brought to the hospital for evaluation. This is only a sliver of the mishandlings in this case. Now, while she was still in that restaurant, before she got taken away, the management had asked her if she could use their phone to call a family member and see if they could cover her tab, or at least they could come pick her up. She had called her great-grandmother, um, who was incredibly confused. She's in her 90s, and there was no way that she could, you know, pay this over the phone, there was no way that she could get out to help, but what the great-grandmother did do was she eventually calls Maitrice's mother, and that's how Maitrice's mother gets clued in that she's being taken into custody. So her mother calls the restaurant later that night and gets all the details on what happened and then calls the station where she knows Maitrice is being held. And we have a recording of that call as well and it's almost terrifying to hear what her mother says in the context of knowing what would happen in this case. Just listen very carefully to exactly what her mother says. I am calling. I'm a little frazzled right now. I understand my daughter is being brought into the station. My Therese Richardson has they made it to the station yet, and she's been booked. Okay, is, is, do you know where she's coming from? Uh, it's some restaurant out in Malibu, and I, I didn't even think to get the name. The okay, manager's yeah, name the is... Only, the only place we have somebody that's in custody that they just announced on the radio that they're coming up is from Joffrey's. In the Pacific Coast Highway. It's okay. the only female that's being brought up to the station as we speak. They actually just put it on the radio right before you called. Okay, okay. I'm I'm her mother, oh, okay. and are you guys going to book her and then release her on her own re recognizance tonight because it, it's just dark, she doesn't have a car, and I don't want her wandering out. I'm, I'm totally just taken aback because this is so out of character for her. Yeah. And you'll see when she comes in, she, she's well-spoken. I think the only way I will come and get her tonight is if you guys are going to release her tonight. If, yeah. if she's going to be held in custody for some type of arraignment tomorrow, mm -hmm. then I will wait until tomorrow. She definitely has no place, you know, I mean, she's not from that area, and I would hate to <laughs> wake up to a morning report, girl, uh -huh. lost somewhere with her <laughs> head chopped off, uh -huh. so I guess I would have to come and get her, oh my God. Yeah, we're in a great hose. The only thing is, at least in the station here, she will be separated, so nobody's going to be with her. Uh, so at least that's, you know, the plus thing, so you don't have to worry about her safety. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I feel safe with her being yeah. in, in custody. It's being released, but I'm worried about it. It's, it's crazy out here. All right. Well, then I will more than likely call and touch bases with you guys a little bit later. Um, once yeah, she'll she call you as soon as she comes in, too. So here's where we're at. Maitrice is in custody, and we know that. And we've already confirmed that she's not going to be released that night. She'll be released in the morning because it's already past midnight. Her mother lives nearly 60 miles from the station, so she just needs to ensure that if Maitrice is experiencing something, she will remain in custody and safe until she can get there in the morning. But that is not what happened here. Allegedly, very late and just after that phone call, officers determined that Maitrice 
was completely fine and ready to be released, and they let her go. I don't have to tell you that something about this feels very off and almost ill-intentioned, especially since we have that knowledge from that recording that her mother had just confirmed that she was going to be held there till morning, and she specifically asked for this not to happen. So all these hours pass into the morning, and her mother wakes up and she never gets a call from the station with instructions on when she should come pick up my trees, what happens next. So she grows concerned, and she ends up calling the station herself, and that's when she learns that my trees was released at 12.30 a.m. We do have a recording of this call as well, and you can, you can hear it in her voice, how frustrated and concerned she is. I think if she had known there was a risk of my trees being released, in the middle of the night while she's in this state of mind. There's no way she would have been okay with that. Listen carefully to the follow-up call with the mother. I'm concerned because, uh, well, first of all, I thought they were going to keep her overnight because she was highly intoxicated. Mm -hmm. um, something, so, so, something is obviously going on with her. Have you she talked tried... to the jailer? And... Yes, 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 I have. He said he tried to get her to stay, but because she was an adult, they had to let her go. I, I believe that she is highly depressed, um, and she, she she's in a depressive state. You know, it could be possible that maybe she... We, I mean, there's a lot of options and I, a, a lot of possibilities, and I don't think all of them would be, um, you know, something dire. But I can certainly understand your fears, you know being your daughter and all that. Well, um, I think she's depressed. That's what has me is more that what, That's worried that. you more than just her, mm -hmm. okay. That and the fact that she's in an area where she doesn't know where she's at. Yeah, does so. she take medication at all? No, she. I, I, I believe it's a state that she's in right now because of just the, the weird activity that's been going what, on. What's her name? Day. What's her, her name? name is, her name is My Trees okay. Richardson. Okay, and your name, ma'am? Latisse. Okay, Latisse. Here, here's what I want you to do. Let, yeah. get, why don't you wait a couple hours and, and give us some time to kind of, I'll go back and talk to the jailer and try and get a timeline of when she was released and, you know, make sure she's not asleep in our lobby or anything like that. And then yeah. once you give us a call back in a couple hours, if she hasn't shown up okay. or made contact with you, then maybe we can do something for you, okay? So if we backtrack to that 12.30 a.m. time frame, we know that Maitrice was released from custody, but we don't really know what happened to her after that. It's the middle of the night, it's pitch black, and it's kind of a residential area. You know, it's pretty quiet, not a lot of traffic. And it was also pretty unlike her. I think most of her friends and family have said that she would have known better than to just wander the streets in the dark, especially not having a phone. But she seemed to do so anyway. The way we were able to sort of backtrack where my trees may have gone into the late hours of the night is that she's spotted by morning in the backyard of someone's home in the hills of Calabasas. The homeowner actually calls the police himself and says that when he woke up, he went to the back window and he saw her just sort of resting on the back steps of his property, like right near the deck. He said he was concerned, so, you know, he called out to her to ask if she was okay, ask if she needed help. She reportedly just kind of gave him this bewildered look. She said, I'm just resting. But he could sense that something was very off with her. Something wasn't quite right here. So that's when he calls for help. But by the time cruisers actually show up, she's gone. And this would become one of the last verified sightings of Maitrese Richardson. So much later in that day, Maitrese's mother actually learns of all of this, and she's infuriated because none of this was reported back to her, even though she had said that her daughter was missing and she was fearful of what could happen to her. There's just this general lack of effort and, you know, absence of concern from police throughout the entire duration of this case. So because this was the last known sighting of where Maitrese was, the attention is then turned to this area in the hills of Calabasas, but it's a very rocky, kind of rough terrain area, so immediately questions are already being raised of how she even got there without a car. They do end up bringing search canines to this area, which do track her scent. They find her scent in the yard, they can track her through different areas of the property, they even find footprints. But at a certain point, they just completely lose her trail. Deeply concerned with all of this information, this is shaping up to be a very 
bad situation, and Maitreza's mother is feeling fairly certain that her daughter was experiencing some kind of psychosis, and if she's out there and she's alone, she's in danger. So her mother goes back to the station, and she asks if they have any footage of her while she was in custody to try to see maybe what her state of mind was just before she was released. And despite having cameras, they deny having any footage at all. They end up claiming that their cameras are for monitoring only, and they don't actually record anything. This, we would learn, was completely untrue. So why in this instance were they insistent on withholding that camera footage of Maitrese in the last few hours that she was in custody. This is not looking good. So the case is actually transferred to the LAPD, the family hires an attorney, and there's a bit of press surrounding the mishandling of this at this point. There aren't very many ways to slice this other than saying it's gross negligence or even something more sinister at the hands of these cops who at this point have been withholding information. So once there's a little more heat on this, that footage that allegedly did not exist is uncovered, and it does show Maitrese in a bit of an agitated state while she's in custody. Although the footage has never been released publicly, it reportedly shows Maitrese in a very distressed state, which only further supports the negligence that she never should have been released to the streets in this state of mind. A search party is then assembled by friends, family, and volunteers who all go up to the area where she was last seen, but they never find anything. Logically, at this point, she hadn't had much water, she definitely hadn't had much sleep, and physically she must have been exhausted. She couldn't have gone, you know, much further than her last known whereabouts, so it wasn't really adding up how she just seemingly had no trail. Something odd about some of the search efforts were that the volunteers had uncovered freshly graffitied messages that were right near the entrance of Culvert Canyon where she was last seen. These were horrifically offensive messages. They were racially charged, they were lewd and derogatory, and although they could never prove that these were directly linked to the disappearance of my trees, I have always found it to be a really odd detail that right around the same time frame and in the same area where she went missing, these graffitied messages just appeared. But this was one of the only pieces of evidence that these searches would turn up. The next development in this case would take a very dark turn. Now, I debated including this portion of the story because there are a lot of conflicting opinions about whether or not this is actually relevant to the investigation, but because there are some semi-credible sightings of Maitrese that fit within the window of her disappearance, I wanted to mention the Vegas theory. It was actually within weeks of her disappearance that Maitrese's biological father, who was in the Las Vegas area, claimed that he saw her in a crosswalk, and he was so sure and so compelled that it was her that he actually got out of his car and he shouted her name, but she kind of drifted into the traffic of you know, people walking and he never saw her again. This didn't hold a ton of credibility for me until there was another sighting from one of her former classmates and friends who saw her in Vegas in a casino. They were shocked and, and you know yelled her name and they started to approach her, but the second that she saw them, she apparently just turned around and ran in the other direction, and they never saw her again. This prompted a further investigation into the Vegas theory, and ultimately, a total of 70 witnesses would come forward claiming that they either saw or interacted with her at some point in Las Vegas during the time period where she's missing. Of course, she's never found there, so all we have to go off of are these witness testimonies, and it does kind of give way to a host of very sinister theories about, you know, how Maitrese may have ended up in Vegas, why she's there, what happened to her later that morning. So leaving the Vegas theory behind, we're now back in the Calabasas area, and this is a few months later, we're going into deep summer, like August. There were two rangers who were in Dark Canyon when they stumbled upon something very, very horrific. Found within that canyon, they would initially spot what appeared to be a human skull that was partially preserved and had dark, curly hair. They reportedly also found articles of clothing nearby that seemed to match the description of what Maitrese was wearing when she was taken into custody. Proximity-wise, this would only really put the remains roughly two to two and a half miles away from her last known whereabouts. Dental records that were assessed and verified later would confirm that these were the remains of Maitrese Richardson, and it was confirmed that she had been there for 
well over six months, which almost entirely rules out the Vegas theory. But there were some strange details about the scene itself and how Maitrese was actually found. For one, after the rangers had called this in, there were deputies who were considered the first on the scene, and for an unknown reason, they took it upon themselves to move the body from the way that it was found. This was odd, as that was a pretty clear violation of protocol, but they were also specifically told from the coroner not to do that as the coroner would come and, you know, he would be able to assess the scene and the body himself. This coroner would actually later come out to say that he had never encountered a case where deputies would take it upon themselves to move or adjust the remains of a body without the presence of a coroner who could at least sign off on the scene itself and try to somehow piece together what had happened here. The body was allegedly found unclothed, which is strange, but plausible, and it's not necessarily indicative that something sinister could have happened. But then comes the debate on the decomp and the skull. The corpse was described as partially preserved or even mummified, which could indicate that they had been deceased for a very long time, but not necessarily in this location or even outdoors. There were also conflicting reports on the head being removed from the body. When it was initially called in, it was immediately reported that the head was severed, but then the deputies would actually chime in and say that it wasn't severed, that they had moved the body, and in the process of doing so, the head had just come off. But again, with the scene being disrupted, and with the remains being fully collected before the coroner could even get there, it would be pretty difficult for them to determine what even happened. How did Maitrese even get there, and why was she undressed, and why? was her body partially preserved. Another strange element to the police work here is that following the collection of the remains, the clothing items were also collected, but they were never assessed as evidence. They were never tested for any DNA, they were never tested for any chemicals or odd substances, anything that could kind of piece together the story of what happened here. The case was just very quick to be closed and sort of labeled as accidental, and Maitrese's mother didn't even find out about the collection of the remains from police. She found out from journalists who had called her asking. So feeling very helpless in the situation and the continued mishandlings by the police, Maitrese's mother actually hires a forensic anthropologist who can privately go in and assess all of the necessary documents concerning the crime scene, photos that were taken on cell phones, the actual remains themselves. Essentially every aspect of this case to try to piece together what is the story that's not being told here. And what she concludes is that, to no surprise, this was grossly mishandled, and it's almost to the point where it seemed intentionally mishandled. I mean, there are police who aren't doing basic police work here. And after she's done reviewing the photos of the scene itself, she realized there are a few details here that are not adding up. The skull, although detached from the body, seemed to be placed right at the top of the torso where the head would naturally be but very clearly it can be seen in the pictures that it's missing a good number of neck bones. The teeth also had a slightly pinkish tint to them, which could indicate a strangling, but in order to properly assess that with a body of this level of decomp, you have to assess the neck bones, which are conveniently missing. What was also strange was that the arm of the body seemed to be in a flexed position, not quite in a way of someone who had collapsed or simply laid down, and certainly not something that could happen just from an environmental standpoint, even though these pictures claim to be the exact way that the body was found. This was a body that was placed in this way, staged in this way. The family then comes after the station filing two separate lawsuits claiming gross negligence as well as withholding information, as there are now forensic experts who are saying not everything here is adding up correctly. Both of these lawsuits are very much in the county's interest to make sure they are settled and everyone is kept quiet, but what that sadly means is that this would most likely be the end of the investigation. That and the statute of limitations runs out within a few years, and the investigation of what might have happened to Maitrese eventually fades away. But her story is still very much talked about in different circles and conversations like this, I think mostly because of how tragically preventable it was, but also how hauntingly mysterious it is. We still don't know what exactly might have happened to her after that last verified sighting on the morning that she went missing or how she even ended up all those miles away. We don't even really know if we can trust the initial reporting of what that scene looked like, because those initial deputies who were there, they had packed up and collected everything before anyone else was there to assess the scene, 
so we kind of have to take their word for it. What Maitrice was experiencing, I don't think we'll ever fully understand, but the key here is that this was a story that didn't need to happen. Had her welfare been valued and she was kept in custody safe, I think she would still be here, and we probably wouldn't be speculating on why the different elements of this case don't add up. Sadly, the finer details of her story will most likely remain unknown, and what really happened to her will remain a chilling mystery. All right, that is all for now. Make sure that you leave me a comment below and talk to me a little bit about this case and what your thoughts are. I wish this felt very uncommon, but I can't tell you how many unsolved cases I've read, specifically cases where there's foul play suspected, where there is just botched evidence or mishandling, and the cases never get solved because of that. And of course, as always, if you have suggestions for different cases, stories, or pictures that you want me to cover, just make sure to comment below and I will check them out and I will catch you on another creep time.